afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Life Unites Us November webinar. My name is Erica Saylor, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar focused on helping you to help others, significance of mental health and substance use parity. Today, we're just going to go over some information um, about the campaign. We'll introduce our speakers. They'll provide uh, a great presentation for you guys. We will have time for question and answer, and then we will wrap up. Um, if you do have any questions today, please put them in the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. Um, we will be going down through questions in the order in which they're received, and it's just a little bit easier for us to be able to sort through those if they're all in the same place. So thank you all for your cooperation. If you do get disconnected from Zoom, please retry the original link um, and we will let you back in. If for any reason you can't get back in, this webinar is being recorded and will be available um, this week for public viewing. So starting off with some campaign information for any of our new uh, folks attending today. So Life Unites is a, is a project developed to reduce stigma around opioid use disorder. This is done by using a people forward approach that aims to connect individuals through stories. Through research and practice and anti-stigma work, we have found that connecting people through their stories and similarities can and will reduce stigma. In order to do this, the team records stories of community members across Pennsylvania, stories of both personal recovery as well as an ally to someone in recovery. Short stories are then produced and featured on the Life Unites Us website and social media. The intent is that by sharing these stories of hope and resiliency, we can prove that recovery is probable, reducing stigma makes recovery more likely, addiction is treatable, those living with an addiction are just like everyone else, and those living with opioid use disorder are so much more than their disease. As I mentioned on the last slide, this campaign can be found online. The website features a variety, um, features a library of resources that are shared across social media platforms, and the campaign works alongside a variety of local partners to bring it to life. The aim is to provide a platform for voices from your community and a resource to add to the work that many of you are already doing to end stigma. Um, and the website is www.lifeunitesus.com. The great news is that you can also join um, in the campaign by following and sharing it. If you're a part of the larger organization or network, we'd love to invite you to become a partner of Life Unites Us. Partners of the campaign have the opportunity to share, uh, to help recruit and share stories from your community directly. As a partner, you can have your logo included on our website, receive curated campaign videos tailored to your community, be invited to monthly webinars and trainings just like this one, get access to exclusive partner resources, and have input on what types of webinar trainings that we do. If you're interested in becoming a partner, you can contact Ashley. Her email address is here on the screen or the general Life Unites Us um, email. And one uh, special announcement today. So uh, as part of the campaign, we do have an advisory committee called the Community Impact Committee. The committee really allows for partners and members of the community to provide feedback on all elements of the campaign and the decision-making processes. We're currently in the process of expanding the committee. Um, we have six open seats and we're currently looking for nominations to be representative of uh, the entirety of Pennsylvania. So right now we're looking for nominations specifically from uh, Southeast, Northwest and North Central regions of the state. Um, so if you, if you yourself or um, you have someone you know who you think would be a great fit for that, um, you can submit a nomination or email Ashley directly, and I'll put links for those in the chat shortly. Um, and I do wanna mention that members of this committee will be compensated for their time. All right, so now moving on to introducing our speakers. Our first speaker today, sorry, I have so many, we were just talking about this, I have so many windows open to make sure I have everything I need to be able to read, so bear with me here for a minute. All right, our first speaker is Katie Zurich. Katie is a senior advisor to Commissioner Jessica Altman at the Pennsylvania Insurance Department and the acting director of the department's Bureau of Managed Care. For the past four years, Ms. Zurich has helped lead the department's efforts related to health policy and innovation 
looking for ways to make healthcare more affordable and available to Pennsylvanians and bringing various state agencies and stakeholders outside of government together to address these issues. In addition, Ms. Zurich has directed interagency and interstate collaboration on mental health parity enforcement and compliance efforts. She's regarded as a subject, a subject matter expert in the areas of healthcare reform, mental health parity, health market conduct examinations. Prior to moving to the insurance department, Katie was vice president of regulatory and policy affairs at Health Spirian LLC in Washington, DC, where she advised national health insurers on policy and business strategies relating to health reform, as well as conducting statutory and regulatory analyses across federal healthcare programs. Prior to that, she served as Compliance and Enforcement Division Director Oversight Group for the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight in the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. She has also served as Compliance and Regulatory Affairs Director for Maine Community Health Options, Communications Director for Maine Bureau of Insurance, and as an Assistant Research Professor at the Center on Health Insurance Reform at Georgetown University. She holds a BA in linguistics from the University of Oregon, a law degree from the University of Oregon School of Law, and a Master of Public Administration degree from the University of Maine. She is currently engaged in coursework toward a Master of Laws in Insurance at the University of Connecticut. Ms. Zurich commits much of her free time to running with her family members. She lives in the Harrisburg area with her daughter, their dogs, Beezus and Dave the dog, and a COVID rescue cat called Einstein. And our next speaker is Katie Merritt. Katie Merritt is the Director of Policy and Planning for the Pennsylvania Insurance Department. Her career in state government began in 2018 at the Department of Health, and she has since held policy-related roles in the Department of Health and the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. Katie is a licensed social worker in the Commonwealth and holds a Master's of Social Work from the University at Buffalo and a Bachelor's of Social Work from Lock Haven University. Her career has been dedicated to public service and pre has previously held roles providing services to underserved populations, including incarcerated people with mental health diagnoses, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence, and young adults with intellectual disabilities. She resides in Harrisburg with her fiance and their two dogs, Monty and Koopa. And now I will turn it over to Katie and Katie to begin their presentation. Great. Well, thank you all so much for having us today. Um, Katie and I are really excited to talk about uh, mental health parity. Um, this is an issue that we both work very closely on. Um, so we hope that we can uh, provide you more information about what mental health parity means and also um, how to report it. Uh, so today we're just gonna go over kind of where we are right now. Um, the significance of mental health parity and why it is so critical that we focus on it. Uh, we're going to talk about our role as the insurance department. Um, there have been some recent changes legislatively that we're also going to go over. Um, and then we are going to share uh, some potential red flags to look for. And finally, uh, we're going to share how to report potential violations to us. So just taking a look at where we are right now, uh, I think we all know the last two years have been very challenging for a lot of people. There have been a ton of um, events that have caused stress, trauma, um, COVID-19, the, the isolation that came with it um, really exacerbated uh, current issues and also um, started new ones. So uh, we, have been seeing some concerning trends over the last year or so. Uh, the overdose rate, the fatal overdose rate last year in Pennsylvania went up 14%. Uh, unfortunately, because we were on a downward trend the previous two years. Uh, and this is not a situation unique to Pennsylvania. It went up about 30% nationwide. So we're seeing this across the board. Uh, this is a little bit of an outdated number, but about 316,000 people uh, in Pennsylvania have a substance use disorder. Um, we have done such a good job at uh, catching um, risky prescribing and educating, uh, educating practitioners. We've also um, started the PDMP, which has been such a powerhouse in reducing um, doctor shopping and pill mills. Um, but unfortunately, 
at that point, substance use disorders don't just go away. Um, so a lot of people uh, turn to other places in order to get um, the substance that they are addicted to. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times it does um, include IV um, use, IV drug use. Um, mental illness is also very prevalent here. About 20% of the population reports anything from depression and anxiety all the way to schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, um, but overwhelmingly anxiety and depression are the most common mental illnesses. Uh, we've also seen some disparities uh, in communities of color and um, taking a closer look at the data, um, seeing which uh, populations have been most impacted. Uh, if you look at 2020 overdose data, I know that um, black and brown people had a much higher uh, rate of uh, fatal overdoses. And that is something that we should absolutely be talking about and addressing. Um, and just to, to continue on the mental health path, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death uh, a young, among young people. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about that a little bit later. So what we are anticipating in the coming months and years, uh, based on all of this data and the um, impacts that COVID have had, uh, we're anticipating an increase in treatment uh, for both mental health and substance use. We're hopefully uh, gonna experience an increase in prescribing of medication-assisted treatment, um, psychotropic medications to help people manage their mental illness, uh, therapy, um, any kind of treatment resources um, but on the negative side, uh, I, we are thinking about um, what is to come uh, and what to prepare for. So um, we're anticipating an increase in suicide attempts, um, an increase in utilization of crisis services for mental health. Um, and unfortunately, we're also going to <laughs> probably see an increase in incarceration um, because people with substance use disorder um, often uh, are criminalized um, for, their, for their disorder. So we're um, also anticipating to see that. And as I mentioned with the IV drug use, um, there are some secondary conditions that could uh, come with it. So HIV, hepatitis, endocarditis, and these are all very serious conditions that could lead to death if untreated. And just to give you a ballpark of how much it costs for one person uh, for treatment of substance use and mental health. Um, so it's about $14,500, give or take, for one year of substance use disorder treatment for one person. And that does not include any of the secondary impacts uh, that could come with it, such as the hepatitis, um, HIV AIDS, endocarditis, and those come with much bigger price tags. Uh, and just a plug for syringe service programs here, uh, you can see that a, a clean syringe costs about 10 cents as opposed to some of the conditions that are caused with using um, needles that have been used by other people and reused. So um, I know we're working hard to try and get that legislation through. And on the other side, mental health uh, is similar in cost. Um, it's about $10,000 or $11,000 um, for one person for one year of mental health treatment. Um, Pennsylvania spends about $5,900 uh, per person uh, on mental health uh, treatment and associated conditions. Um, and this has been a trend since 2009. And uh, we are seeing to the, the increase in suicide attempts um, and that has a potential to cost billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, last year, I think it cost $70 billion in work-related losses and also um, in medical costs. And now we are uh, wondering what is the significance of mental health parity right now? Um, it is critical because as we are anticipating an increase and in an uptick in um, people utilizing services, uh, people also need to know their rights um, and what they are entitled to under their insurance policy. Uh, full disclosure, I am a social worker. I'm a licensed social worker. Uh, I went through bachelor's in social work, master's in social work, and throughout my uh, 
schooling, I had not been educated on mental health parity. Um, I only knew about it because I chose to write a research paper on it one time, um, but it is so important that we start to incorporate this in regular education for all types of providers. Um, we're also thinking about uh, COVID and mental health um, in a parity context and kind of trying to weigh um, would treatment for mental health or substance use disorders that is tied to COVID um, any, in any way, uh, would that be covered the same as physical health services for COVID? So that is just a policy question that we are um, thinking about. And finally, um, I think it is super important to spread the word about mental health parity because we get so few complaints. Um, in 2020, we got one complaint. And so far in 2021, we have also gotten one complaint. Uh, and we, we know that violations are happening, which is the unfortunate part. We know that um, people are not getting covered the same as they would for physical health services on the mental health side. Um, and unfortunately, we don't find that out until five years later when we do market conduct exams and go back retroactively and look at all of the claims. Um, so we are hoping to educate providers, we're hoping to educate consumers, um, family members, we're, we're really hoping to get the word out about mental health parity, um, what people's rights are and how they can report it to us and how we can help. And I will turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Katie. Um, we like to keep it easy here, just everybody's Katie. Um, so um, what's really critical about what Katie was saying in terms of the market conduct exam, as regulators, we have an opportunity to you know, look at what's in the market before it goes out into the market. We look at what's out in the market um, and, and see how claims are being processed, see how companies are handling um, when patient claims come through and, and prior auth requests come through. We also, when we get consumer complaints, you know, just the one for mental health parity, but we get lots of others as well. We have an opportunity to um, address the immediate concern that a single consumer or patient has. But then we can also say when we see trends, when we see a couple of patients or consumers complaining about the same thing, we can start to identify trends and look more deeply into that and, and adjust our policies and our procedures to um, look for these things in different ways. And, and that's where being a regulator is all kinds of fun. Um, and what's more important is that when it comes to mental health parity analysis, it is the regulator's role to review and confirm the analyses submitted by insurers. We were having a conversation among stakeholders and a consumer advocate said, it is too hard for consumers to conduct an analysis on mental health parity. And I was utterly shocked that, that this, you know, well-educated in the world of insurance and health insurance and consumer advocacy, his understanding was that he and his clients or his, you know, his, his service area, that they were the ones who had to provide the analysis was, it, it bowled me over. Um, so I wanna start with, it is not the role of the patient or the provider to do the analysis. It is the role of the insurance company. They are to do that analysis and submit it to the regulators. And then we take a look at what they've submitted. And what we're looking for and what we're looking at is how do they limit quantitative treatment um, or how do they limit treatment measures? Um, how do they limit the cost sharing and the financial um, requirements that are required of a, of a patient. So we're looking at what are the visit limits that are applied to say um, physical therapy versus visit limits that are applied to any office visit for mental health services. Is it a $5 copay to see a PCP and a $27 copay to see a behavioral health specialist? Um, you know, how do those things compare? And there are very specific analyses that are listed in federal regulation 
that that need to be followed to figure out if those limitations are appropriate and meet the legal and regulatory standards. Um, and so, but that's that's our job. It's not the job of the providers and the and the consumers or patients. The other thing we're looking at is non-quantitative treatment limitations. So these are the limitations that they may be totally appropriate. Medical necessity. When you're talking about health insurance, you know, the insurance company has a has a business interest in covering things that are medically necessary, medically appropriate, you know, that support someone's health. Um, it's, it's not appropriate for, for someone to be, you know, looking, seeking reimbursement for a service that is, is not, you know, something that they, that they need or, or that isn't, you know, medically appropriate, I think. And there, there are all kinds of examples that come to mind, but, you know, I think we, we as a society, and I'm painting with broad brushstrokes aware of some of the underlying issues with this, but, um, you know, it's it's not in in the interest of of health insurance companies to pay for you know cosmetic surgery simply because I don't like this you know angry wrinkle that's right sitting here in the middle of my forehead. I wouldn't want them to re reimburse for that because if they have to reimburse for me and everybody else, then all of our insurance rates go up. So fine, that's not medically necessary. They shouldn't cover that. But when the insurance company turns around and says well, we're not calling cosmetic surgery medically necessary because it's not appropriate for anyone. Um, and, and, but then they say, and we're especially not covering it for someone who's, um, you know, who needs, you know, a, a breast augmentation because of cancer or because of, um, you know, diagnoses relating to, you know, gender dysphoria or, or other issues like that. Then there might be a question, and we might have to look into that more. But that's the regulator's job, right? It's not the patient's job or the, or the provider's job necessarily. Other non-quantitative treatment limitations include prior auth and step therapy and other ways that um, an insurance company might put a barrier in front of seeking services for mental health or substance use disorder treatment that aren't being placed on the medical surgical side. So those are the two main terms that we ask you to learn today if you don't already know them, QTL and NQTL for the mental health parity analysis. So some of the, the really critical things that have happened just in the last 14 months um, are enhancements to the legislative and regulatory structures that give regulators, that give us at the state level and our federal counterpart the ability to seek information and um, and really dig into what um, insurers are doing. The first is Pennsylvania Acts 89 and 92 of 2020. Those were signed into law by Governor Wolf on October in October of 2020. I think the date was October 9th. It might have been the eighth, but um, certainly October 2020 was a was a great day for those of us in the in the mental health parity world because what that did was it clarified for our insurance companies that are that operate in the health insurance market in the state um, that we were going to ask for information and they needed to provide it to us. Um, we were going to ask for their non-quantitative treatment limitation analyses. We were going to ask for um, the mathematics and the calculations behind their quantitative treatment limitations. If they're going to put a 30-day visit limit on all behavioral health office visits, how does that meet the mathematical standards that are set out in the federal regulations um, for, for purposes of, of the products that they want to sell to Pennsylvanians? The next thing that happened late in December of 2020, the CAA or the um, Combined Appropriations Act was passed. And somewhere around page 4,500 of that law, which is appropriations, right? We're mostly talking about money. Um, Congresswoman Katie Porter of California um, put in a requirement that non-quantitative treatment limitations um, analysis had to be done, had to be given to regulators upon request. And if insurance companies did it wrong, they had time to fix the analysis and update their systems but if they don't do it, then they're not in compliance with 
the mental health parity requirements, both at the federal and then we have the opportunity to pull that into the state level enforcement efforts. Um, piling on to that, um, FAQ 45. So since the Affordable Care Act started, there have been 44 other FAQs that have come out that have included information about mental health parity. But FAQ 45 came out in April of 2021. And for the first time, the federal government really set out the, the details of what is a sufficient non-quantitative treatment limitation analysis and what is insufficient, which um, is, is huge for us. Because one thing that has been happening a lot and happened in our market conduct exams was companies would bury us in paper and they'd say, you know, this is the policy for how we do prior auth for the medical side, please read these 800 pages. And these are the policies for how we do it on the mental health side, it's the same. Well, that's not a comparative analysis as required by the law. Comparative analysis is step one is like this on this side, step one is like this on this side, here's how they match up. So having this clear indication of what's sufficient and insufficient has been incredibly helpful. And it's only been a few months. We are, we are as regulators, really looking forward to um, being able to leverage this standard um, information across carriers and across the country um, to really do better mental health parity analysis. Because when we do better mental health parity analysis, we can make sure that the limitations and the barriers being thrown up in front of people seeking mental health and substance use disorder treatment aren't happening. So the question for all of you and kind of the point of today's uh, presentation is what can providers do? You all have fantastic access to an amazing amount of information that we as regulators don't see, or by the time we see it, it's too late. But that information really supports the mental health parity enforcement efforts that we talk about. So patient records, do you see denial trends um, you know, with a particular company when you're, when you're dealing with that company across multiple patients? Do you see service hour reductions that seem inappropriate when you're putting forth medically necessary service hours for behavioral health treatment, but they're saying, oh no, we, we're only gonna give you 10% of that, but they're saying 10% of that every time. This is information that we really don't have access to unless and until we do a market conduct exam. And then if we don't have very targeted questions in our market conduct exams, we may not see that. So if you are seeing that with your patients and you're able to share that information with us, raise the concern, then we can look into it, we can dig into it, and we can know what questions to ask to get at that, to get at that and figure out if there is a problem. Also, communications and instructions that come to you um, from the insurers. Are they sending you details about their own internal process changes and asking you to follow them? Are they sending you crosswalks for code edits and then you do it and you get denials back? And when you call in and say, we, we, we made the code edits you asked us to make, we submitted the codes you asked us to submit, what's going on? Um, we've heard from providers who have said, you know, we, we make that phone call to the insurance company and, and we get nothing. We get either silence or they say, no, no, you have to do it a different way. And what was communicated isn't even how they're handling it internally. Um, it's a little bit of crazy making and, and it needs to stop. And, and you know, that, you, that might just be that the company has to get better and be less sloppy. Um, in terms of how they're communicating things from their policy people to their, you know, their phone, their call center reps or whatever, but but it's got to be done correctly because messed up code edits, improper denials, that impacts treatment for people and it impacts lives. We know that. Um, what do the denial letters look like? What do the explanations of payment look like? All of these pieces of information we have a hard time getting at. Um, but we know that they, um, they can show more than, than you would even realize when it comes to a mental health parity analysis. Um, and you know, someday 
maybe we can all sit down and talk about like what kinds of denial letters and explanations of pain that we've seen. Um, they, they do get a little, they do get a little unfortunate thing going, um, going along. So the way you all can help, because again, we're not asking you to do these analyses and we're not asking you even to determine that something is or is not a parity violation. What we ask is that when you see these red flags, you share them with us, especially when you see them more than once. Um, first of all, looking at a patient's out-of-pocket expenses. So what does their cost sharing look like? If you're a behavioral health provider and the copay for your patient is $25 and they complain because, oh, their PCP copay is only $5, we might wanna look at that. And the same way, if you're a PCP or a healthcare provider, on the medical surgical side, and you're talking with someone and you ask them or they volunteer information about behavioral health and they say, yeah, but my copays are $50 to see my, you know, my therapist, we might want to look into that. And so um, we, we ask that, you know, if you're seeing that kind of thing, you don't have to seek out extra information, but if, if someone is is sharing that information with you or your office managers or, or receptionists are seeing that, you know, it might be something that you want to flag for the regulator. The other thing that might come up is if a, um, if a deductible has to be met before mental health uh, and substance use disorder services are covered, but there's no, you know, but the deductible is already waived on the med surge side, medical surgical side, um, that might be a red flag and regulators might want to look at that too. The other thing, another red flag that we've um, run into a lot is prior authorization, also concurrent authorization or concurrent review. Um, with these, what we see a lot is that prior authorization might be required before providing most mental health and substance use disorder, disorder services, but not for the medical surgical services. And sometimes what we see on this is that there is prior auth, the medical surgical services exist on the prior authorization list, but they have an auto authorize. Whereas on the mental health and substance use disorder side, they get flagged, they get flagged for manual processing, things go really slowly. There's more all this, all this information that needs to be provided. Um, so it's really, it, it's not necessarily as easy as you would think to, to identify the differential between the mental health and substance use disorder side and the medical surgical side. Another red flag that we run up against is step therapy. So here, if the outpatient program treatment um, option is required for mental health and substance use disorder before they even consider inpatient services, but the same is not true for medical and surgical diagnoses, we as regulators wanna know that because sometimes that's okay, sometimes that's appropriate. But other times it's really not. And, and we wanna know how the companies got to that decision. That's the other part of the mental health parity analysis. For the non-quantitative treatment limitations, it's very subjective, but what we're looking at is the processes. How did you get there? Did you get there because you wanted to throw up a barrier because mental health and substance use disorder treatments might be considered expensive today? Um, or did you put that up there because you know, we really want to see that, you know, you've tried this in the substance use disorder world, because if we go to the next level, it's, um, you know, there, there are a lot of, there are some potential negatives that, that could outweigh the benefits. So we want to try a lower level. There, again, there are medical reasons and there are, there's clinical evidence to support that sometimes step therapy is the right way to go, but it's not always true. And it's not allowed if it's really just a barrier because the company doesn't want to spend the money. Another red flag we run into is exclusions. So think about um, buprenorphine covered for treatment of pain of medical conditions. And that's a very small amount, I guess, is my understanding. I'm not a, I'm not a medicine person. Um, Erica read the whole list of things that I've, I've done in, in recent years. And none of that is being a doctor or nurse or going to medical school or any of the other um, clinical practice type schools. Um, so my understanding is that for medical conditions, if you're treating pain, you know, you might use a certain amount of different types of, of drugs at a very small level. But then if you're treating substance use disorder conditions or doing medical assistant 
medically assisted treatment, medication assisted treatment, sorry, everybody. Um, for substance use disorder, you know, the, the company might say, well, we, we do need to do a prior auth or we do need to do some requirements there. That may be fine, but the question is, how are they getting there? And are they saying, no, we just don't offer that for substance use disorder conditions um, ever? And, and why? We want to know why as the regulators. Um, but we may not see that that is excluded for substance use disorder conditions without that flag um, coming into us from providers and from consumers. Another red flag is fraud, waste, and abuse. And for those of you who are providers out there, fraud, waste, and abuse, obviously a very big deal. And we appreciate that companies do want to cut down on fraud, waste, abuse, and abuse for everybody's benefit. But if we see companies asking for additional information and requiring so much information to support the medical necessity for mental health and substance use disorder, but the same requirements are not being applied to the medical surgical condition. We want to know and we want to see how those can, you know, how those fraud, waste, and abuse efforts are really being handled. Are they painting the substance use disorder and mental health services with, you know, broad brushstrokes saying, well, we found some fraud in some substance use disorder. So you know, we pull all substance use disorder and all mental health services for fraud, waste, and abuse uh, review, but we only pull, you know, 10% medical surgical condition fraud, waste, and abuse files. And those, you know, the, it has to be so obvious as to, you know, warrant us pulling that. I mean, there, it's, it's amazing some of the things we have seen um, and, you know, the, the company thought it would be just a, a, a get out of jail free card to say, well, it's, it's all for our fraud waste abuse efforts. So you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't look too closely there. Um, I, I was not super happy when I heard that, uh, that response and, and they heard from me how unhappy I was about that. Um, but again, you know, these are things that you're going to see more quickly and, and more readily than we will be able to get at. Um, on the regulatory side. Um, another red flag is, is network. And this is the last one I'll talk about. This is really tough because providers and insurance companies need to be able to contract freely to talk about networks, to talk about reimbursement, to talk about you know different relationships with a, within a contract. We don't get into contractual relationships. What we do get into, however, is if generally payments for behavioral health and substance use disorder services are well below market rates, while payments for medical and surgical providers are comparable to market rates. Um, this is problematic, and this has been identified as the federal by the federal government as a priority to examine. And several states have seen a lot of things with, with the, the process by which companies arrive at their reimbursement rates for behavioral health providers versus how they arrive at those rates for medical surgical providers. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot there that's not about the contracting, that's more about the, just the mindset about how important and how much we're willing to pay behavioral health providers. Keeping in mind, when it comes to cost and it comes to the financial benefits of having an adequate network with several different kinds of behavioral health and substance use disorder specialists, we can actually see long-term trends in medical costs go down if the behavioral and substance use disorder stuff is done right. And that goes back to Katie's earlier slide about the you know, $11,000 a year for good behavioral health services versus you know, 70 million in, you know, because of you know, suicide attempts and, um, and mental health for everyone deteriorating. The other thing that often happens with network build is credentialing requirements. We have seen mental health and substance use disorder providers be asked to get credentialed with the insurance company and then go through the credentialing process again with the behavioral health vendor that the company has contracted with to process mental health and substance use disorder claims, to do utilization management, so we've got a, a double, you know, a double set of credentialing requirements for mental health and substance use disorder providers than for medical surgical providers. And um, 
you know, someone's going to have to do a lot of explaining to get me to understand that that is not just throwing up barriers because we don't want to cover behavioral health. So those are the, the red flags we have from the regulator side. Um, I will say we, we have, you know, the opportunity to report right now. Um, we have a Bureau of Consumer Services. They are fantastic. Um, we encourage people to contact consumers, um, you know, to, to contact consumer services if you, if one of those red flags comes up. As Katie mentioned, we only, in the last couple of years, we only have seen like one mental health parity complaint in the consumer services area each year. Um, and it's not for lack of outreach to consumers. So we do a ton of work trying to reach out to consumers. Um, so it really comes down to the providers, the, the consumer advocates, the, you know, the loved ones who are trying to help someone get from, you know, a low point to treatment. Um, you know, you might, those, you guys are the, are the folks who are going to help us understand what's really going on out there more so than, than a consumer who has to, who has to call in or submit their information. And there are multiple ways to submit the information, but if you see a pattern, we, we really would love um, to, to hear from you um, and take it into our court to, to do the investigation. Um, with that, I think we can close and Katie, I will turn it back to you. Sure, great. Um, yeah, as Katie was mentioning, I think we are the only uh, state agency that is actually welcoming complaints um, and we want you to complain to us. So do not worry about being annoying. Um, even if you have an inkling that it is a potential violation, we do want to know. Um, so please do feel free to uh, use the, the reporting tools that Katie mentioned. Um, we're happy to take any questions from the audience or any questions from Erica or Caitlin. Hi, Katie. Let me switch the view up here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, guys did great. There's so much interesting information that I didn't even know. Um, it's really helpful. So it looks like we have one question so far in the Q&A. Um, the question is, with the increase in suicide attempts and trouble gaining access to me um, mental health medication, is there or are there plans to encourage primary care providers um, to also provide recommendations to mental health care providers? Sure, yeah, that would likely be um, more in the provider education um, wheelhouse, but absolutely as an administration, we are very passionate about access to mental health treatment. Um, so we would definitely encourage um, primary care providers if they do suspect that a patient has a substance use disorder or um, mental health concerns that they do refer them to um, the appropriate mental health uh, practitioner. I think another thing we've seen, and honestly, mental health parity enforcement and oversight is, is going to have to adjust to this. But as, as care integration happens, as, you know, as, as physical and mental and substance use disorder and, you know, surgical services are all mixed together, um, we, we want to see that care integration. We want to see whole person treatment. Um, we know that a person who gets a diabetes um, diagnosis or a cancer diagnosis isn't going to walk away feeling like, okay, that's cool. Um, they probably will need behavioral health services. They will probably need additional services across the board, right? So I think generally the trend of, of integrated care across the board is really, is really critical. And I think... Um, it's like Katie said, that's a, that's a provider education point that, um, well, I think will continue to grow. Great. Thank you both. Is there any other questions anybody has? Please feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will give anybody another minute here. And I've left our... Um, reporting the phone number and the, the link um, 
up here, but if you go to the insurance.pa.gov website, you will see, I think from every page, you can access the file a complaint uh, page. So um, once you get to the insurance, the PA insurance department webpage, um, you'll see all of this information um, accessible from, from several entry points from our, our webpage, but I've left this up here in case anybody um, needs to grab that. Perfect. While we're waiting, I have a quick question. I'm not sure if you mentioned it or maybe I just missed it, but I know you mentioned in the past two years, you guys have only had like one complaint, um, you know, each year. As you're, you know, retroactively reviewing, um, you know, all of this information you receive from insurance companies, you know, what's the ratio of like what you're finding versus how many people are actually coming forward? Yeah, um, it's pretty significant, um, and and um, that's what's so worrying. In our market conduct exams, we are able to ask for restitution for um, co-pays that that individuals have paid out of pocket, or you know, or other out of pocket financial um, experiences for for the patients or the consumers. Um, we can say, you know, insurance company, you should not have charged that person $100. Um, please pay them back. And we can do that retroactively. Um, and we've done that in some cases, we've seen several hundred thousand dollars go back to consumers um, because of those overpayments of a five or $10 copay, even. But because it's, you know, for a chronic condition, it's five or ten dollars every two weeks, or five or ten dollars a month, or sixty dollars um, per visit over the course of multiple years. So that we can have companies pay back with interest under our law. What we can't do, looking back, and this is why getting in front of this is so important, is um, if a prior authorization is denied and a person doesn't seek services, if um, a concurrent review where an individual who is in inpatient treatment comes out and the, um, the company says, we're not gonna pay for inpatient treatment anymore and a person is sent home. We don't have any way to um, get those days or years or, or lives back. And so that's why this is so important that we, that, you know, that we as regulators are reaching out and saying, please help us help everyone. Um, to do that right, because the non-quantitative treatment limitations are the are the things that if if something gets done wrong, um, or if they're implemented incorrectly, or the barriers are put up when they shouldn't be, um, it's impacting lives. So, um, it but but we we have seen, you know, hundreds and and you know hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> probably um, that 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 if we needed to put it in in terms of money, that's what we're looking at. Um, but it, it really goes beyond money. And, and I think the number of people who could complain if they understood that they needed to complain um, would overwhelm our call service center, <laughs> quite truthfully. And all of our results from these market conduct exams are public. So you can go through our website and find the fines that we've issued to companies. You can find the number of mental health um, parity violations and the, the revenues that we've had um, insurers do. I know one of them, uh, I was not involved in this at the time when um, I was at PID, but uh, there was a company that was required to do a, a mental health parity, mental health um, education campaign uh, because of the violations that we found and how they were so egregious. So um, there, we definitely take action and um, you can find all of our actions on our website too. Great, thank you both, that's very helpful. We've had a few more questions come in here. Um, first one, what does the department do with um, complaints for self-funded plans? So those, unfortunately, because we don't um, regulate the self-funded business that's regulated by the Department of Labor, we um, provide information on how to contact the Department of Labor. 
Um, but in addition to that, you know, I, I was just talking with someone who was like, wait a minute, the Department of Labor, there are people there. It's not just a big scary building in DC. Um, and she literally said that. And I was like, nope, nope, there are people there. They're lovely people, in fact. We know them by name. We call them up sometimes. Um, but but so you will be redirected if it's a self-funded plan, but at least we can help you find the right phone number or the right communication avenue to get there. What is um kind of deep in the weeds background regulator secret squirrel information is that the Department of Labor and the state regulators can coordinate on our investigation and enforcement efforts because so much of so many of the insurance companies that offer insurance in our commercial market um, that we have authority over also offer self-funded business and so we can, because they, they streamline their business processes, we can work with the Department of Labor to share information about, uh, about companies and the way they're doing things so that we can work together. So even if you're calling us and saying, I have this thing, it's a Department of Labor issue, it's self-funded, but it's for this company that also operates in Pennsylvania as a commercial population, we can we keep track of those calls and we can look and say, okay, wait a minute, how come this particular company had 25 calls to us, all their for their self-funded plans, um, zero about their commercial stuff? Like maybe we should make a call to the Department of Labor and see what's going on there. So we can collaborate on that stuff. And and um, even though we're we're having to ask you to contact someone else to file your complaint and and officially submit information, the, the metadata really that we're gathering from that phone call is still helpful. Um, it's, I know it's, it's, a, it's a burden that I hate that we have to put on consumers or providers to, to get to the right office and submit the right paperwork, but um, it's, not, um, it's not unhelpful and it's not, it's not you know, submitting things into a deep black hole in, in a concrete building somewhere in DC. Thank you. Next question. It looks like um, a 69 year old gentleman um, is on oxycodone for daily pain related to a workers comp incident that happened when he was 20. He went to an insurance agent for help with Medicare selections or changes. And when the agent found out he was on oxycodone, he said he couldn't help him with his Medicare selections. Um, who would be responsible for um, addressing that type of complaint or who could this person reach out to to have that complaint addressed? Yeah, Medicare, unfortunately, Medicare is one that we have, I think by virtue of federal regulation, we have largely been pushed out of any enforcement assistance um, on there. And so I think, um, the the you know if you if you contact our consumer services they will probably have a number for you to contact Medicare, um, they're the Medicare consumer services, um, but Medicare.gov I think has um, also has a place to submit information about um, complaints. So I that that one unfortunately is is one that is at least for our knowledge and our interaction is a little bit more of a black hole, but, um, but I do believe that Medicare.gov has, if you're, if you're on, if you're able to get on their website, they, um, I think they have complaint information. And then again, I think if you call our consumer services bureau, if you don't have access to the website, they, um, I believe they have the correct phone number for the Medicare complaints. And if it were a complaint about an agent in particular that might not be helping somebody because of this issue, um, you can reach out to us about that. Great, thank you guys. And last question here, what are you seeing as far as people being required to participate in programs that are not mandatory but are being told that they are? Um, 
just for some clarity, is this like for court ordered treatment? Um, that's a great question. It looks like Justine May submitted the question. If you could um, type in the Q&A and just provide any clarity. Um, they said, such as a center of excellence programs. I mean, I think that it, 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 the answer for me, oh, and, and Katie might laugh, um, so you can watch her face to see how she responds. But um, my first answer is always, it depends. Um, there are definitely, you know, there are tiering structures for some insurance companies. There are, um, you know, preferences and, and sometimes, I mean, I'm gonna say requirements, but it's kind of a loose requirement that, that might not be the right word that you start with a center of excellence because of the, because the outcomes are gonna be better. Um, and there are quality measures, honestly, in the background that, that insurance companies have to address as part of their you know, operation in the state. So some of these, some of the things they require as far as coverage, um, again, they might be okay. But if they're saying you have to go to a center of excellence for you know, this particular treatment and the closest center of excellence that provides that treatment is 175 miles away, um, we, you know, we might have a problem. <laughs> so, um, so like, like I said, it, it depends. Um, but I think there are, there are different nuances that go with that, that um, I think our consumer services folks might be able to assist with, or if, you know, if you report it and, um, you know, and they can't necessarily assist with that. Having the flag from our end allows us to look look into it more. It's kind of my non non answer answer. Yeah, insurance is complicated. Um, <laughs> it is complicated for um, anybody. I mean, before I came to the insurance department, I did not know a lot. So. Um, in general, if you come to the insurance department, there is no wrong door. We will help you get to where you need to be. Um, even if you're not sure if you should complain to us or the federal government, you can feel free to reach out to our consumer, our consumer services and they will be more than happy to help you work on your situation or if not, um, refer you to the correct people that you need to talk to. Thank you both. Um... The person who asked the question also follow up, followed up and said, a clinic in the area is now requiring all of their clients to participate in their center of excellence program, even if they've been there for several years and have refused the service. The, the clinic is requiring that? Yes. Yeah, if the clinic is, so the, if, if it's the clinic requiring that, then it, it falls outside of our jurisdiction. And so there might be, there might be some other there might be other some other factors at play that that we, um, you know, that that we may not be able to get to. But I, you know, I think um, if there, you know, I think if if we can, um, uh, if you get in touch with the consumer services, they might be able to help um, sort out and and troubleshoot and ask you some follow up questions to kind of figure out what's going on there and see if we can find the right people to help. Great, thank you both. And we are at time and it looks like there are no more questions. So we will uh, go ahead and wrap up for today. I just wanna thank you both so much for um, presenting on today's webinar. Um, I do wanna let everybody know that when you do close out of this webinar, you will be taken to a survey to provide some feedback on today's webinar. We're always looking for candid feedback on um, our webinars and how to give you guys more information of what you need. Um, I'm also going to drop the link for that um, follow-up survey in the chat as well. Um, and I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. And thank you again, Katie and Katie. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.